teachers, let me ask you a question. Are your kids just too loud in the classroom? Or maybe they have trouble keeping their outside voices well outside? Or maybe your principal has even told you that your class needs to quiet down. Let's face it, we all know there isn't a magic pill that will fix this problem or some expensive high-tech gadget we can buy that will make it all better. But what can we do? Listen, I've been there, my friend, so I get where you're coming from. Every year, it is a struggle to get kids to use their inside voices in the classroom. And some years, it's more difficult than others. I remember one year in particular when I had four little boys in my classroom who all lived in the same apartment complex. Their mothers were friends and they had been raised together since birth. These boys played on the playground every single day together since they could walk. They were more like brothers than classmates and their shouting in the classroom, it was totally out of control. And I kept asking them, use your air quotes, inside voices, please. But they didn't have an inside voice. I was at my wit's end. Here's the thing. Almost every single preschool teacher on this planet will tell you that their class is just too loud. And while it may seem like you're fighting a losing battle, there are ways that you can teach smarter, not harder, when it comes to getting your kids to self-regulate their voice levels. Here are five easy steps to help you get started. Step number one is to ask yourself which noise level is appropriate for the age group that you work with. Are my expectations realistic? Do I need to adjust my expectations at all? Sometimes those teachers who are most bothered by noise levels in the classroom are new to teaching in an early childhood setting. The general rule of thumb is the younger the child, the louder the noise, because young children have only been on this planet for a very short number of months, and they're learning how to communicate. And part of learning how to communicate is learning how to self-regulate your voice. So what that tells us is that we need to help them learn how to do these things. Now in step two, you're going to take into consideration the students who are sitting in front of you. Ask yourself, do they really know what inside voices and outside voices are? Have I taught them specifically what these look like, sound like, and when it's appropriate to use each one? And at this point, a social story is a really great way to introduce this self-regulation concept of modulating one's own voice levels, right? When we're outdoors, we can increase the volume of our voice. And when we're indoors, we can decrease the volume of our voice. Next, in step three, it gets a little more concrete because now we're ready to actually start teaching this concept of self-regulating your own voice level to our students. So first things first, I'm a big proponent of creating things with the children in the classroom. So we're gonna make a T chart. That's the letter T and then chart. And when I say make it with the children, I mean we start with a blank paper. So there is a blank piece of chart paper that there's no pre-cut out pieces that are glued to it. Um, that's a lot of extra teacher work that nobody has time for. So you're going to have some markers out and you're going to have your chart. You're going to draw a line down the middle and a line across the top to create that T, right? And you can write inside on one side of the chart and outside on the other if you want. And maybe draw a little picture of a house for inside and a little picture of the sun for outside, whatever you want. And then you're going to throw out some scenarios for your kids. Give them a scenario and then let them decide where it should be on which side of the chart. So you might say, um, I'm playing at centers with my friend. I'm in the block center and we're building a structure and the teacher is working with a small group. What kind of voice level should I have when I'm talking with my friend? And hopefully, because you've already read the social story and you've talked a little bit about voice levels, they might say, that's an inside voice. So draw a little picture. Stick figures are fine. Nobody cares if you can draw. Kids don't care. Actually, simpler is better. So go on in that way. Give them another example. You know, I'm outdoors. I'm throwing a ball around with my friend. My friend is way over by the fence. I'm over by the tree. So I shout, hey, give me the ball. Which kind of voice level is that? inside or outside, and then draw a little picture to represent that along with some words on the T-chart. And go in that way for 
maybe three examples for each side at the most for young children. And then you're going to take that chart and you're going to say, okay, whenever we have questions about when we can use inside and outside voices, we're going to look at this chart. This is inside. You're going to review it with them. And this is outside. And then I would put it on the wall somewhere at eye level in the classroom where they can refer to it. And that is a very effective and meaningful way to help them better understand the voice levels. So, so far you've got social story and you've got a T-chart. And step number four is my favorite method, and that is to use finger plays to help children learn how to self-regulate their voices. And so the way that you do this um, is you use very simple finger plays that you probably are already using in your classroom, like Itsy Bitsy Spider, right? I'm sure all of you have done this before, but this is actually... In addition to the many other benefits of finger plays, this is actually one way you can use a finger play to teach children to self-regulate their voices. And this one is the itsy bitsy spider, right? So as you sing the itsy bitsy spider, everybody knows the song, the itsy bitsy spider went up the water spout. You can do it in different voice levels. So we're going to do the eensy weensy itsy bitsy teeny tiny little spider now you're going to use a very soft voice because he's so small and then you're going to sing it very slowly the itsy bitsy spider and you're going to use like a whisper voice and then you're going to go up in volume to the huge enormous spider and you're going to give a very deep voice and you're going to use your arms in big motions the huge enormous spider went up the water spout. You can use your whole body motions and use a deep, the deepest voice you can make. And they're going to um, have a very visual and an auditory representation using their whole body um, and the listening and speaking and all these great things to learn how to, to um, self-regulate their voices. Another one you can do, um, everyone's probably familiar with, or hopefully, <laughs> um, two little birds and, and usually I've always called them Jack and Jill, um, two little red birds or whatever color you want, two little red birds sitting on a hill, one named Jack, one named Jill, right? And so, and it's fly away, Jack, fly away, Jill, come back, Jack, come back, Jill. Um, but you could do it in different voices, right? So you could do two little loud birds sitting on a hill, one named Jack, one named Jill. Fly away, Jack. Fly away, Jill. And so you're using that loud voice, that outdoor voice. And then you could do two little quiet birds. Two little quiet birds sitting on a hill. One named Jack. One named Jill. Fly away, Jack. Fly away, Jill. Come back, Jack. Come back, Jill. And so you can modulate your voice and you can use just about any finger play to do that with. You can use a big, enormous voice, an outdoor voice. You can use a, a soft, quiet whisper voice. You can use just a talking indoor voice. Um, these are very, very effective for helping children learn to self-regulate their own voice levels. Now, the last step, step number five, is very simple, and it's to use visual picture cues to help your students better understand the different voice levels. So you could have a large mouth that's open, a picture of a large mouth that's open. That's an outdoor voice. That person is shouting, right? Ah! And then you could have um, different pictures to represent different things, like two kids talking to each other with little talk bubbles or the little talk lines um, could represent like an indoor speaking voice, right? And the little tiny whisper voice could be a child with his hand in front of his mouth, things like that to help them really get a visual of what that looks like. Because so far, all we've done really, aside from the social story, is talk a lot. And um, we know that a lot of kids, especially those who are second language learners, who have auditory processing problems, there's all sorts of kids who have different uh, learning modalities. They need that extra visual picture cue to support them. So there you have it. Those are five easy steps to help you get started with teaching your students how 
to begin to self-regulate their own voice levels. Now, just remember, we're not looking for perfection. There is no preschooler on this planet, no pre-K, even kindergarten child, who's going to have mastered all of these voice levels and when they're appropriate. This is something that's a gradual process that they learn over time, and some people never learn it, right? And next up, we're going to look at some pitfalls to avoid when it comes to helping your students in these situations. These things are going to make it harder, not just for you as the teacher, but for your students as well. And the number one pitfall to avoid is something that some of you know as a yakker tracker. Other people may just know it as a traffic light. And this thing is uh, programmed to respond to different noise levels in your classroom. And so it will flash red when it's too loud. Some of them even make noises. I've seen many different types of these come and go over the years. They've been around for quite a while now. These seek to just control student voices, in my opinion. I know there's a lot of teachers who believe in them, but I think they seek to control behavior because they're not helping children learn to self-modulate anywhere else outside of those four walls where the Yakker Tracker is used, right? And there's also digital versions of these that people show on their smart board. Again, they may be effective in some cases, but I just don't think they're going to carry your children throughout their lives, right? When they go to a store or a restaurant or when they're at home, there is no Yakker Tracker. When in fact, what we really want is for students to learn to modulate or self-regulate their own voices. So it's kind of uh, goes against what we're actually trying to do. So that's an example of working harder instead of smarter. The next one is rewards or punishments. So we know from all the research out there that rewards and punishment are just another way of controlling children's behavior. They don't do anything to help children learn how to self-regulate and um, improve their own behavior at all. They just seek to control it right? So some examples, taking away recess if they're too loud, that never helps anybody, especially the student and not you either, because now you have angry kids or kids who, the ones who most need to get out, out that energy on the playground are the ones who are getting punished. So that's never an option for anybody anywhere. Using rewards like marbles in a jar, pom-poms in a jar, whenever the whole class does well. Again, these are just artificial means of controlling behavior and they're, they're considered rewards, like extrinsic rewards. Like we'll get a pizza party if everyone is quiet during center time all week or, you know, you know, if we're doing better on improving our voice levels, things like that, they don't help children actually learn the skills they need to be successful in school and life, right? They're all about controlling behavior. The third pitfall that you want to avoid is something that's really popular in older grades, and it may work great there. I have no experience with children beyond first grade, um, but it's the numbers for the voice levels. Okay, so when we're talking about preschool, that's children five and under, right? This is completely working harder instead of smarter because now your kids have to translate. So like you're putting barriers between them learning how to modulate or self-regulate their voices by adding in the numbers. So for example, what I'm talking about in case you're not familiar is maybe there's five different voice levels you've designated. You've got the quiet whisper voice all the way up to the loud outdoor voice. And each one's been assigned a number, right? So one would be a whisper, five would be shouting. And you hold up numbers or fingers to represent these voice levels. Something gets lost in the translation with young children when you do this, right? So you have to assume a number of things first. You have to assume that they know the numbers that you're using. So if you're using visual numbers, like the written numeral, you have to assume that they know that that numeral is number three. Next, another level of barrier that you're putting between the child and success is they have to know and understand that that number is associated with a voice level. Okay, so now we're talking about long-term memory, right? So we've got two barriers to success here. Um, and then they have to actually do the thing and remember what the thing is. So these types of methods may work for older children. 
they do not work with younger children. The fourth one, the pitfall to avoid, is flicking the lights on and off to get them to modulate their voices like it's too loud. I'm going to flip the lights off and on. I am just not a proponent of this at all, unless you're in a hard of hearing classroom, right? Because that's how we do get children's attention who don't have enough hearing to hear any of the sounds, noises, or whatever that's going on. In my opinion, a scare tactic. That doesn't mean that if you use it, you're a horrible person. I just like to be mindful of all the children in the classroom. And the odds are that you have at least one child in your classroom who's afraid of the dark. There's always one child who's going to jump, cry out. I've seen it time and time again in many classrooms where 99% of the class is fine with it, but there's always one, two, one or two kids who really have a hard time with that. And so we want to be inclusive and make sure that the types of methods we use to get children's attention, in this case for reminding them of the voice levels, that these methods are appropriate for the age group that we work with. And just an aside, I want you to remember that TikTok, in my opinion, is a cesspool of bad teaching ideas. It's where good teaching practices go to die from what I have seen. Yeah, never a good idea to take your classroom management tips from TikTok. So far, we have covered the solutions to teaching children to self-regulate their voice levels with those five easy steps. And we've covered some pitfalls to avoid. Now we're going to do a little fine tuning or troubleshooting. And these come directly from questions that I've been asked by teachers over the years. So the first one is, what if my principal says my class is too loud? Well, if your principal says your class is too loud, then you probably have to do something about it. And I would ask in response to that statement or question, when is this principal saying that it's too loud? Is it when you're in the classroom, in the hallway? What time of the day? What is it that you're doing when the principal has noticed that your class is too loud? So if they've noticed that you're too loud in the classroom, you have already those five strategies I gave you to help improve that level. Now, if you're in the hallway, and this is, this is what happened when I was in the classroom. We had to be whisper quiet on state testing days, right? Some of you can relate with that if you're in the public school. We didn't have bathrooms in our classroom. We also had to go to the cafeteria. So we were out of our classroom a couple times that day. All recess was canceled on state testing days. We couldn't be in the hallways. I remember we had to do something, right? Or we'd get in trouble. We were told that. So I would teach my kids that on testing days, it's only really like two days a year when it has to be pin drop silent. We would pretend to be mice all day. So I would say, today we're going to be little tiny mice. We're going to go in the hallway. We're going to tiptoe like little tiny mice. We're trying to be quiet and we're not going to talk. We can, we can, we can do this. You know, and I would tiptoe and whisper and um, pretend I was walking on marshmallows, all kinds of things, things like that. In emergency situations, right? If you need to be really, really quiet, you can do some great make believe pretend things with your kids to get them to be really quiet. This technique really worked with my students because we would limit our time in the hallway, of course, during those state testing days, but doing some kind of pretend make believe thing with them really helps with that. And another question I've received over the years is what if my coworker tells me my class is too loud? And to be honest, I get these types of questions way too often. So for example, my co-teacher or grade level colleague tells me I should be have a more quiet class, right? Fill in the blank, whatever it is. And my response to those types of questions is always the same. And my response is that's their opinion, right? When my husband says that I drive too fast or I should slow down when I drive, he's sharing his opinion. When he says that my cooking is too bland, he's sharing his opinion right? Does it make me do things any differently? I may slow down the car when he's in it with me. And I may hand him the salt shaker when I serve dinner. Here's the thing about opinions. Everybody has one, but that doesn't mean they're right or that you have to listen to them. But if your coworker says that the noise from your classroom is so loud that it's disrupting the learning in their classroom, then you have to maintain that professional relationship and work on improving that noise level, right? But if they're just sharing their opinion because they want you to teach the way that they teach or confirm that their, their way is the best way to do it, then it's just an opinion. 
There you have it, my friends. Those are my five easy steps to help your kids learn how to self-regulate their own voice levels, some pitfalls to avoid, and some troubleshooting tips. All of these will help you teach smarter, not harder, in your own classroom and set your kids up for success. I hope you got some great ideas to take back and use in your classroom right away. If you like this episode, we have many others that you can listen to or watch here at Elevating Early Childhood. And don't forget, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, I'm Vanessa Levin. Onward and upward. If you think these videos are valuable, you have got to come check out the Teaching Trailblazers program. Teaching Trailblazers is the place for teachers like you to get the professional development resources and support you need to thrive. It's where you can learn relevant, life-changing best practices with professional development created specifically around the challenges early childhood teachers face. It's where you can get access to a complete research-based pre-K curriculum that you can use either to supplement your existing curriculum or use on its own to get 100% of your students kindergarten ready by the end of the year. And it's where you can hang out and connect over all things early childhood with other teachers just like you and me. It's my favorite place on earth and it will change your teacher life, I guarantee it. Come join us at teachingtrailblazers.com to get more information and apply today. That's teachingtrailblazers.com. I can't wait to see you there.